We got it. We got it. it it's okay. I got it. Okay. <clears throat> Hi. Good afternoon. Hi. Could I have everyone's attention, please? I know you're all still in the middle of lunch, and please go ahead and uh, continue to enjoy your lunch, but we're going to get started because we want to stick to the schedule and get everybody out on time. Uh, my name is Lori Weisberg. Uh, if you were here this morning, you heard a bit of the introduction. I'll just uh, repeat briefly. I was a member of the Stanford Medical School class of 1979, and I've been on the board of the uh, Stanford Medical Alumni Association for the last eight years and uh, the last two years as president, and it's been an absolutely fabulous experience. So we're going to continue on now with our uh, afternoon program, but I just want to take a moment to thank a few people. Weren't those sessions this morning fantastic? I thought they were just great. Um, we, we have several of our uh, seminar speakers, panel speakers here. Would you all stand up and let us recognize you with a round of applause? <laughs> And uh, I also want to recognize uh, several members of our Board of Governors, the Medical Alumni Association Board of Governors, who do so much to keep the organization active and vibrant and engaged and put on fantastic uh, um, events like this. So could I have all of our board members stand up and be recognized as well? <laughs> And one more thank you to the volunteer class representatives. The turnout today was enormous. We're sold out, as you know. The room is packed to the to the rafters. And um, I would like to ask our class representatives representing the reunion classes who did such a great job of in increasing our attendance, would you all please stand up and be recognized? <laughs> And we have several, uh, several of our current students are here. We're very happy to have you here. Uh, representatives of all of our constituency groups, MD graduates, PhD graduates, uh, nursing school graduates, master's graduates, and trainees in the uh, PhD postdoc, intern, resident, and fellow categories. So all of those people, welcome to everyone. And I would just like to say I'd like to meet and talk with as many of you as possible. A couple of people have come up to me already, expressed some interest and perhaps uh, becoming part of our board or uh, participating in committees of the board. If you have an interest or any questions that you have or any ideas that you have to make your organization better, please approach me. I'll be around the uh, rest of the afternoon and also at the cocktail hour and the dinner this evening. Please let me know. I'm happy to talk with you. Uh, so now I'd like to just uh, share an experience that I had recently, which you can file under the category of serendipity. And this, uh, this is a concept that I love because so many of our career decisions, so many of our choice of specialties, our field of research, were uh, made by chance events. Uh, perhaps you worked with a, uh, an excellent resident or attending physician uh, who was inspiring to you and a great role model and appreciated the hard work you did during a clinical rotation. Or perhaps you worked with an accomplished scientist who taught you a tremendous amount and inspired confidence in you when you were facing a difficult lab rotation, or any of the little moments that uh, led to you pursuing the path that you did. So here's what happened. I gave a friend a ride home from an event recently, and he happened to ask about when I moved to California. And I told him that I drove from New York to California with a college classmate. We were both about to start medical school here at Stanford. Uh, we went camping and backpacking and touring around on our three-week trip across the country. We took I-80 from the East Coast to the Midwest, and we went to I-90, went from the Midwest to the, to the West, and then uh, back to I-80 down to San Francisco and on to Palo Alto. And then I asked him when he moved to California, and he said that as a child in the 19... 50s, he drove with his family uh, before all the interstates were built. Uh, he drove with his family uh, from Chicago to San Francisco along the Lincoln Highway. Now, I'd never heard of the Lincoln Highway, even though I'd been living in California since 1975. And so he told me all about the Lincoln Highway, named in honor of President Lincoln, many portions of the road built in the 1910s, 1920s, all kinds of interesting facts about its history, its route, its starting and ending points. Have, have any of you heard of the Lincoln Highway? 
Oh, quite a few people. Okay, well, you're, you're ahead of where I was. Uh, so uh, maybe you know that the western terminus of the Lincoln Highway is in Lincoln Park in San Francisco. It's near the Lincoln Park Golf Course and the Legion of Honor Museum. And if you know San Francisco, it's up near Clement Street and 34th Avenue. So I went over there last week, and I took a picture of the iconic post marker. It has red, white, and blue logo of a big capital L and a bronze medal plaque with a relief sculpture of Abraham Lincoln, and on the side of the postmarker, it's engraved Western Terminus of the Lincoln Highway. If you want to see this photo, just ask me. I have it on my cell phone. So does anyone know where the Eastern Terminus of the Lincoln Highway is? What state and what landmark? Nope, not Chicago. Any other guesses? Not Philadelphia. Not Springfield. It's in New York, and it originates at Times Square. So next time you're in Times Square, look for an iconic L marker. So serendipity. My friend just happened to mention the Lincoln Highway. I got all jazz looking it up, searching around on a bunch of websites, Wikipedia. This was happening just around the time that I was trying to compose something witty and inspiring to say to you today. So I realized, wow, this is truly serendipity because I found a great quote to share with you, plus a reference to the dean of the Stanford School of Medicine. Well, not exactly him, but to his specialty. So you'll hear about this. So this is the quote that I loved. Beatrice Massey said, uh, after traveling the Lincoln Highway many, many years ago, she said, you will get tired and your bones will cry aloud for a rest cure. But I promise you one thing, you will never be bored. No two days were the same, no two views were the same, no two cups of coffee tasted alike. My advice to timid motorists is go. Uh, so I'll bet that no two cups of coffee tasted the same. There were no Pete's and no Starbucks in those days. Uh, but with a few small modifications, this sounds to me like the same advice any of us in the Stanford Medical Alumni community might give to encourage students in the medical school or graduate school phase of their life. We've all had wonderful mentors who have made huge impressions on us and inspired us, just as Beatrice Massey inspired her timid motorist friends. We all could be, in many, and in many cases have been, inspiring mentors for others to help them keep going even though their bones are tired, and to help them appreciate the excitement that arises from no two days ever being the same in the clinic, the hospital, or the laboratory. Uh, one of our top priorities at the Stanford Medical Alumni Association is to involve our incredible alumni in mentoring events for the medical students and the graduate students. And we've had several highly successful events this year, and the engagement between the students and the alumni was crucial to their success. If you attended any of these events, perhaps a SOAR dinner or the, for the PhD students or the Explore dinner that we put on for the medical students, you'll know what I'm talking about. I'd encourage as many of you as possible to participate in future programs because we need you. We need you to make these events even better in the years to come. Uh, so uh, my last point, I learned that there are numerous references to the Lincoln Highway in literature, radio, TV, film, and in medicine. What? In medicine, you're thinking? Yes, indeed. Here is the medical reference. And uh, Dean Minor, this one's for you. Harris Mosier, in his 1929 address to the American Academy of Otology, spoke to the assembled otologists and called the carotid sheath, a layer of connective tissue, the Lincoln Highway of the Neck <laughs> because of its role in the spread of infections. So, more serendipity. Uh, the Lincoln Highway even provided me with the perfect segue into my introduction of Dr. Lloyd Minor, Dean of the Stanford University School of Medicine, who is an otologist. Dr. Minor became Dean in December of 2012. Before coming to Stanford, he was provost and senior vice president of academic affairs at the Johns Hopkins University. During his time there as provost, Dr. Minor launched several university-wide initiatives, such as the Gateway Sciences Initiative to support teaching innovation and PhD education. He coordinated the Individualized Health Initiative with the goal of using genetic information to tr transform healthcare, a topic that you've all heard a lot about today. Prior to his appointment as provost in 2009, he served as professor and chair of the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery in the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and otolaryngologist in chief 
of Johns Hopkins Hospital. Dr. Miner is an otology expert, as you now know. Uh, he's uh, best known for his discovery of superior canal dehiscence syndrome, a debilitating disorder characterized by sound or pressure-induced dizziness. He was instrumental in describing the cause and clinical manifestations of this syndrome and in developing a surgical procedure that corrects the problem and alleviates the symptoms. Dr. Miner received his bachelor's and his medical degrees from Brown University, trained at Duke University Medical Center and the University of Chicago Medical Center, and completed a research fellowship at the University of Chicago and a clinical fellowship at the Otology Group and the Ear Foundation in Nashville, Tennessee. In 2012, he was honored by being elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. Quite an honor. At Stanford, he is professor of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, and by courtesy, professor of bioengineering and of neurobiology. Among his many accomplishments at Stanford, Dean Miner has led the development of an innovative model for cancer research and patient care delivery at Stanford Medicine and has launched a biomedical data science initiative. Dr. Miner has been extremely busy, productive, and inspiring in his first two and a half years as dean. And I can tell you from my own personal experience in working with him, he has the qualities of a leader who will be going strong for many years to come. Please join me in welcoming Dean Lloyd Miner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lori. Well, good afternoon. It's wonderful to see so many of you here today. I know many of you have traveled long and far to get here. Some of you a bit shorter distance, but still it's great to have you here today to pack the room. Uh, and we hope that this morning we've been able to share with you some of the exciting things that are going on uh, here at Stanford. I want to give you a little a brief overview in the next few minutes uh, about where we are today and some of the exciting things we're doing. And then I look forward to meeting with you this evening uh, when we have the reception and then the dinner over at the Alumni Association. And I thought I would start just by telling you a little bit about who we are today. Um, first of all, Stanford Medicine. Stanford Medicine is the School of Medicine and the two hospitals, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital and Stanford Healthcare. All three of us, the school, the two hospitals, are a part of this wonderful university. So on a combined revenue basis, we're about a $5.6, $5.7 billion operation. We provide about $320 million a year of direct clinical benefit, direct community benefit to, our, uh, to the communities through the uncompensated care we provide and also through the many activities we have going on in East Palo Alto and other areas across uh, our region. We have 1,735 faculty today, and we have also foundation physicians. We're expanding and building a network of care in the East Bay, in the South Bay. And to do that, we are acquiring primary care practices and bringing them into foundations that are jointly managed by the School of Medicine and each of the two hospitals. We have a staff of almost 16,000 people working um, between the two hospitals and the School of Medicine. We have 3,600 trainees, that's medical students, PhD students, postdoctoral research fellows, residents and clinical fellows, 3,600. 42,000 inpatient hospitalizations at the two hospitals just next door here, and over 1.5 million outpatient visits at the clinics on this footprint and also the outpatient clinics in Redwood City and around our region. Also, just from looking around, and of course for those of you in the, who live in the area, you can't miss it, we're doing a lot of building. Two new hospitals, that uh, both of which have been topped off now. The new Children's Hospital will be completed in 2017. It will add about 440,000 square feet of space uh, to provide state-of-the-art facilities for taking care of children with the most complex illness, cardiac diseases, cancer, and other things that require the type of tertiary and quaternary services that are uniquely provided here at Stanford and at Packard Children's Hospital. And just out the window here, the new adult hospital, 840,000 square feet of beautiful, new, state-of-the-art facilities, uh, both procedure facilities, operating rooms, intensive care units, that facility will be completed in late 17, early 18. Um, and with those two new hospitals coming online, we'll, have, we'll move from today about 600 beds, 600 acute care inpatient beds on our footprint to over 900, about 930 uh, acute care beds. 
and to be able to provide the care to these patients as well as to advance our mission of excellence in research, patient care, and teaching, we're growing. We're growing as a faculty. We just, about a week ago, had a presentation, a four-hour presentation to the Stanford University Board of Trustees. That consolidated revenue uh, on the slide that you see up in front of you, 5.7 billion, represents about 66% of the consolidated revenue to Stanford University today. And on our trajectory of growth, that'll be about 72% in a decade from now. In order to continue to keep pace with the growing activities in research, with our growing leadership training activities, with the impact we're having in clinical care, we anticipate that our faculty will grow in size by about 48% over the next decade. To get to those numbers I just described to you, we've been engaged in a comprehensive strategic planning process at Stanford Medicine for over the past year. This process has involved all of our departments, the leadership of all of our departments. It's involved the presidents and CEOs of the two hospitals and their leadership teams. And through this process led us to an integrated comprehensive strategic plan that includes the financial parameters for what we plan to achieve, also includes a plan for the next 20 years of what we hope to see occur on this campus in terms of facilities and also adjacent campuses in Redwood City and, and other places. As we were doing this planning, we asked ourselves, what can we do uniquely? How can we lead the biomedical revolution? That should be Stanford's goal in everything, is to lead. And in so many respects today, everything is evolving towards, or many things are evolving towards, the biomedical revolution. If the 19th century was a century of chemistry, in terms of science, and the 20th century was a century of physics, the 21st century is a century of biology and medicine. And we see so much evidence of that. Today, two-thirds of the faculty in our chemistry department, just across campus drive here, two-thirds of the faculty in that department are doing biologically related research. And we could walk across, we could look in any science or engineering department in the university today and find a substantial number of faculty that are focusing on biomedical problems. Not because anybody's told them they have to do that, far from it. It's because our faculty are attracted to the problems where their input, their science, their studies, their research can have the most transformative impact. And increasingly, those problems and those challenges or in biology and medicine. So there is a biomedical revolution going on and we want to be a leader in it. So where do we see ourselves leading and how do we see ourselves leading? Well, What I want to briefly describe to you this morning, this afternoon, is where we hope to lead in creating and defining and then broadening and expanding the field of precision health. Now you've all heard of precision medicine. President Obama talks about it. Uh, every institution, every active medical center in the country has some sort of initiative in precision medicine. And we for sure do as well. But we see precision health as being the next generation of precision medicine. So precision health is proactive, it's predictive, it's preventive, it's preemptive. And yes, it focuses on being precise and being individualized for the diagnosis and treatment of acute diseases. But it does much more than that. It looks several steps backwards before disease has developed to ask the question, how can we come up with better indicators of disease, with better predisposing factors, and then intervene or offer the knowledge that leads to interventions to prevent diseases from developing before they get started or in those cases where they can't be prevented to detect them at a much earlier stage so that their treatment is far more effective. So precision health is proactive and preemptive. Precision medicine tends to be really reactive. That is, how do we, and, and there's, believe me, if you, for patients with cancer, being reactive is exactly what you need and want to be. You want to deliver the most precise, individualized treatments based upon the genomic, genetic characteristics of the tumor. But precision health seeks to intervene and learn and understand the steps before cancer develops. 
so that hopefully more and more cancers can be predict predicted or detected earlier. It's preventive, it's precise, it's personalized, it's focused on keeping you healthy. It's focused on health care in contrast to precision medicine, which is really mo fo more focused on sick care. How do we take care of patients once they're ill? For sure we need to do that. For sure we are doing that. But also we see an opportunity to do much more than that and therefore to have unique impact in this field of precision health. So when diseases do develop, Precision helps Health seeks to correct, restore, and improve health by bringing the best genetic, and you heard a lot about that this morning, molecular and population science to the benefit of each individual. The goal is to make care precise for the individual. The other goal of Precision Health is to coordinate care across multiple specialties and in a longitudinal fashion. That's something we've focused on a lot in cancer care here at Stanford. You know, patients with cancer typically receive treatment from multiple different specialists over the course of weeks, months, and years. And there are lots of opportunities for things to fall through the cracks, for care not to be coordinated, for the patient and his or her family to have to be the people who actually keep other health care providers informed about what's going on in the person's care. We don't want that to happen. We don't want that to ever happen. We want, that, we want to assume the responsibility for the complexity of cancer care. And one of the ways we've done that is to add a new group of providers, multidisciplinary care coordinators, oncology nurses, that travel with the patient. So we're all familiar with physician's assistants, nurse clinicians that work with specialists, but these multidisciplinary care coordinators travel with the patients to any appointments they have, they're assigned to the patients, not to any one specialist, not to any one mode of care delivery. And in so doing, they're in the best position to make sure that the care remains coordinated and the, the needs of the patients and their family are being addressed throughout the process. We also want to evaluate the care we deliver. So in our Cancer Transformation Initiative, we're not just transforming cancer care, but we're evaluating it as we're doing it. We're looking at what's effective, what's working, and what's not working. Because we see this as being a model, first implementing in cancer, but then a model for other diseases, and ultimately a model for other academic medical centers and healthcare delivery organizations to follow based upon evidence and, and studies that are done here to validate the most effective modalities. We believe Stanford is the place where this vision of precision health can be realized. We have a history of innovation. I don't need to tell any of you about that because you've all had the privilege and the pleasure of being here at Stanford and experiencing it and contributing to this innovative, creative, entrepreneurial environment that has so characterized our institution for 50 years or more. Our relationship to Silicon Valley, one of the projects we're extremely excited about moving forward. Some of you may have read about it. It was covered in November, I believe, in the Wall Street Journal. But with Google, we're working on what's called the Baseline Project. The Baseline Project will enroll about 10,000 people, and everything you can imagine is going to be measured on those people. Every omic you can think of, every physiologic parameter. And they'll be stratified into risk groups according to the risk for cancer and the risk for heart disease. And those that have had cancer or heart disease that will, be, that will then be followed for indicators of recurrence. So from this study, from this very comprehensive, most comprehensive longitudinal cohort study to be conducted, we, Stanford, working with Google, and uh, Duke will also be a part of this study because we want a demographically diverse population across the country. From this study, we hope to have a lot better indicators of the determinants of disease and the determinants of health moving forward because of the analysis of this information in a truly unique and transformative way. Well, another reason we feel like we can execute on and make precision health here a reality is because of the inherently interdisciplinary culture of Stanford and because of the vision and the entrepreneurial and the discovery-based dedication of our faculty. So we envision the strategic plan for strategic health, for precision health to be a tree and what better place to have a tree as being the metaphor for, uh, for a strategic plan. 
The trunk of the tree is defined by fundamental research in biomedical data science. Everything in a tree is dependent upon its trunk. And everything that we do here at Stanford is dependent upon, in medicine, is dependent upon our strengths in fundamental research in biomedical data science. And these fuel nine transformative platforms, and they're listed on this slide. I won't walk through them individually. Uh, they shouldn't come as a surprise to any of you. They are areas where we have a lot of excellence and impact today and where we see our engagement involvement growing even more in the future. And then we have, of course, the areas of clinical care. Now, this, this outline of the tree, the clinical service areas on the adult side uh, labeled SHC and on the pediatric side labeled uh, LPCH, you could find those areas of, of service lines on any, ac in a, any academic medical center in the country. The difference, the difference at, here at Stanford is that each of these, each of these clinical care areas benefits from its connectivity to the core transformative initiatives. And those core transformative platforms in turn benefit from their connections to fundamental research in biomedical data science. And of course, all this leads up to the top of the tree, which is a focus on predictive, preventive, and longitudinal care, an area where we in the US healthcare delivery system have a long way to go, but where we at Stanford see opportunities to lead because of the networks we're building, because of the strengths we have historically in fields like bioinformatics, biostatistics, and now bringing those together uh, to look at the care we deliver to, and provide before patients are ever sick, the pre preventive and preventive care that we're able to provide. Genomics, of course, plays a huge part in all of this, and that was the theme of today, a very appropriate theme for a discussion of, of biomedicine, the status of biomedicine in 2015. It's from genomics, it's through understanding an individual's unique genetic makeup that we can predict and prevent many of the diseases that, that, that may occur, and then increasingly we can design the precision therapies based upon, in cancer, for example, the genetic characteristics of the tumor. So the core elements then, I, I chose two examples here to show you how what we're, from the outer rim of the tree, how what we're doing in cancer and what we're doing in cardiac care benefits from the core of the tree. I won't walk through them, but, but virtually every element of the core of the tree has some relationship to each of the clinical areas on the tree. And it's those synergies and interactions and how fluidly they take, here at, they take place here at Stanford because of the integration that we have as an academic medical center so well ensconced within this great university uh, that we're able to make these clinical service lines uh, preeminent moving forward. So that's just a bit a thumbnail sketch. I also want to say in terms of what we're doing curriculum-wise in, um, in, in the school based upon this goal to lead in precision health, based upon our desire to continue to train the outstanding leaders of tomorrow, just a few things that I want to mention to you that, I, that I'm really pleased about that I, that I hope you will be as well. I see it in the room today we have several of our leaders from Medical Center Development. We have the extraordinary good fortune of having the very, very best Medical Center Development team in the country here today. They work with us so closely to have the resources that we need to do transformative things here in Stanford Medicine. One of the um, changes we were able to make last year because of a group of anonymous donors who uh, saw the importance of this initiative is that we were able to guarantee the first four years of support for PhD students through a combination of training grants and philanthropy. You know, there are a lot of perverse incentives in, in graduate education today, and one of them is that you can have an outstanding student who really wants to work in a certain faculty member's lab because that faculty member is doing work that he or she feels particularly attracted to, feels particularly qualified to, to train in and excited about. And yet if that faculty member in the past, if that faculty member didn't have a slot on one of his or her grants, oftentimes the response to the student was, well, I'm sorry, no, you know, I can't take you in my lab. 
And so you had students choosing labs based upon financial exigencies, not based upon the science that they wanted to do, the science that was motivating to them. And you had faculty members turning students away that they would have loved to have worked with, but they just didn't have the particular grant funding at that time. That's not happening anymore here. Students choose the labs they want to work in based upon their qualifications, their interactions with mentors, and the effect has been immediately palpable. We just finished our PhD admissions process and, and had um, the date by which students respond as to whether or not they're going to accept our offer of admission. Our yield for our incoming PhD class in September of 2015 was 67%. Two-thirds of the students we offered admission to our PhD programs accepted our offer. I'm proud of that. I'm even more proud to tell you that 76% of the underrepresented minority students offered admission to a PhD program in biosciences at Stanford University accepted our offer of admission. 28% of the incoming PhD class will be members of underrepresented minority groups. That is a real accomplishment. It's something we've been striving for for a long time, certainly something we have to focus on continuing moving forward. But that's, that's what's possible here at Stanford. I chose that as one example. We could walk through the medical school process and find other examples, but a powerful example of how we're able to do things here, make things happen because of the support we've gotten from our community, the support we get from all of you, and because of the vision and the energy and enthusiasm that I think all of us here experience and, and feel for our future. So enjoy the afternoon. I think you have some, we have some time. We're going to move into an award ceremony here in a moment, and then you have some time to look around the campus, and then we get back together uh, this evening for a reception and for dinner. Thank you very much for being here.